7, verse 14. And it reads, it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Shalom, Israel. Today's topic is why you should want to be a Hebrew Israelite. You know, it's funny. When you tell a lot of people that they're Israelites, you get all types of responses. They say stuff like, I ain't no Israelite, I'm a Christian. And then they get specific. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pentecostal. Or, I'm a Muslim, my brother. <laughs> and it's funny because they say that with great pride, as if that's something great. And then they always ask the question, well, why should I want to be a Hebrew Israelite? You know? So, I figured I would do a video about this, about this topic, and explain why you should want to be a Hebrew Israelite. We're going to do a breakdown of Romans 9, verses 1 through 4 in detail and show and explain why you should want to be a Hebrew Israelite. All right, so let's get right to it. Romans 9, verses 1. First, we're going to read 1 through 3. This is Paul speaking. Verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. All right, let's look at that. So far, Paul is saying that he's telling the truth. And that he is so hurt by what he sees that he is willing to be cursed away from Christ if it would fix the relationship between his people and the Most High. Look at verse 3. Paul says he's willing to be cursed for his brethren and for his kinsmen according to the flesh. See that statement, my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh is a very important statement to understand. Paul is saying that he's not willing to be cursed away from Christ for just anybody. Uh-uh. Paul is not willing to do this for some random person or some random group of people. That's not what he's saying. Paul said if it was possible, he would do this for his brethren and for his kinsmen according to the flesh. What does that mean? That means his people, his family. His flesh and blood, he would do that for them if it was possible. He's not talking about a spiritual family. He's talking about his actual brethren and kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, let's find out who his brethren and kinsmen according to the flesh are. Verse 4, who are Israelites? Is that clear? Everything Paul said he was willing to do for Israelites. Notice that he didn't say anybody else other than the Israelites. You can't find the other nations in the word Israelites. Now, if you want to bring up the whole spiritual Israelite argument, all you got to do is go back to verse 3. Here's the quote. My brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You have to be born an Israelite. You can't become an Israelite. You got to be born an Israelite. Now, why is it important to know you're an Israelite? Let's finish verse 4. Verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? Okay? Now, what's the adoption? Because the adoption pertains to the Israelites. The adoption is Christ dying on the cross. Because through his death, Israel was adopted back to the Most High. Let me say that again. The adoption is Christ dying on the cross. Because through his death, Israel was adopted back to the Most High. Let's prove it. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption 
of sons. Now, verse 5 says, to redeem them that were under the law. Okay, who was under the law? The law wasn't given to everybody. The law was only given to Israel. And I'll prove that later, but let's look at Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Still dealing with the adoption, okay? Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, well, his name is Yahweh Shai, but for the, purpose, for the edification of others, we will say Jesus Christ. Let me read verse 5 again. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So according to the Bible, Yahweh Shai, uh, Jesus Christ, gave his life for Israel, for the Israelites. Because his death on the cross is the adoption. And Paul said in Romans 9 and 4 that the adoption pertains to the Israelites. Now let's go back to Romans 9 and 4. It says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory? All right, now what's the glory? What is the glory? Here's the answer. The glory is the kingdom of heaven. Let's prove that. Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. All right, this is the disciples talking to Christ and asking him a question. Verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is why when Christ rose from the dead and appeared before the disciples, they thought they were about to get the kingdom because they knew the kingdom was for them. Let's read it. This is what I'm talking about. It's in Acts 1 and 6. This is after Christ rose and he appeared to the disciples. Verse 6. When they therefore will come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See? Because they knew that the kingdom was for them. So when Christ rose, they was like, oh, it's time. <laughs> so according to the Bible, the glory which is the kingdom of heaven, pertains to Israel. In case you didn't know, the word pertain means belongs to. So the kingdom of heaven belongs to the Israelites. All right? Let's go back to Romans 9 and 4. It says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants? All right, now, now we're dealing with the covenants. What are the covenants? The covenants are the Old and New Testament because the word testament means covenant. So everything written in the Old and New Testament revolves around the Israelites. A covenant is an agreement between two parties. Let's prove that the agreement is between the Most High and Israel, Israelites. First, we'll go to the Old Testament. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33. All right, and it says, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We're going to stop right here for now. Please click on part two, and we'll pick it up where we left off.